For Inside Carolina, I'm Taylor Vipolis, and this is Up in the Rafters, where I'm joined by Carolina basketball legend and 2017 national champion, Justin Jackson. Justin, first off, happy holidays. Hope you guys had a great holidays in Boston. Saw saw the big win against the Bucks. Since the last time we talked, Carolina wins at Madison Square Garden against Ohio State, and they win in Charlotte in the first Jumpman Invitational against Michigan. The win streak is now up to four. With the holidays, I know a lot of Carolina fans are, are feeling pretty good right now. What were your biggest takeaways after watching those last two games in which Carolina beat two quality Big Ten teams? To be honest, man, it was just the competitiveness that I saw out of North Carolina. Um, obviously, the Ohio, the Ohio State game, you know, they were getting beat pretty much the whole game. Um, but you saw how they kind of picked up, pressured, um, and full court, got out in transition. Um, obviously, Mondo the last two games has been a monster. Um, but just their, the way that they competed and the energy they played with, um, I think, was totally different from, you know, for sure the games that they, they lost and some of the other games they struggled in. Um, so I think seeing that, you know, then you add on kind of the talent that they have at the guard position. Obviously, we talk about Mondo. Um, that's just kind of a, you know, icing, icing on top. So um, to see them go out there and compete against, like you said, two very good, very good teams. Um, you know, I think it's just kind of something they can take momentum from. And we're not going to be looking too much at the games this week. We're going to be taking questions from the Inside Carolina premium message board. And it's the first one's not really a question. But it's a guy who who wants to make a point real quick, and uh, I'll phrase it a different way. But you know, just like Rudolph saved Christmas, how fitting is it that on this podcast, it might have been New York City that saved this team? <laughs> hey man, look here. Uh, if you if you still want to hold on to you know New York being the best state and having the best talent and all that kind of stuff. Um, you can do that, man. But um, it, it's it's fitting for you that <laughs> that's where their momentum picked up. So we'll keep it at that. And we've seen this team kind of change the way they look and, and the way they play. Hubert Davis mentioned it in his post game after the Michigan game. He said, in transition, we've made a couple of changes in terms of getting more spacing. And it's allowing us to get layups and dunks, pitch aheads for wide open threes, and Armando down on the post right underneath the basket. And he mentioned that one thing that they changed when a play wasn't working, they just went into like a light ball screen and they've kind of gone away from that. And it's now more of a like orchestrated type movement. What changes have you noticed watching this Carolina team? Yeah, I think that's honestly, that's probably the biggest thing. Um, there was a lot in that, you know, early on in the season you saw kind of they would run their first action and then it would just be a Caleb Love or R.J. Davis high pick and roll. Um, and the problem with that is eventually teams can start kind of scheming against that, you know, whether it is they just switch the ball screen and force you into isolation basketball or, you know, the big traps to get the ball out of the, you know, the point guard's hands. And now you have to make a play with somebody other than your um, like real playmaker. So I think now seeing them, you know, if the first action doesn't work, then you just move the ball, have, you know, you might just kind of be freelance, you know, you might just go pin away or set a flare and cut or, you know, just kind of randomness to keep the defense honest. Um, and I think seeing that and allowing Mondo to be able to have the ball on the block with all of that happening, um, I think is why you've seen him be able to, you know, get better looks inside and not get doubled and things like that. So, I love what they're doing um, offensively when it comes to kind of the randomness and things like that when the first action doesn't work. Yeah, Armando Baycott has looked a lot healthier um, the past two games for Carolina where he goes for 28 against Ohio State and then 26 against Michigan. How much of Baycott's play do you think is his ability of – not only the team deciding, hey, we're going to play through our, our preseason All-American, but also his work ethic to catch the ball low where he's not catching it at the free throw line and he's catching it deep where he wants to, when he wants to. I think it's kind of a mixture. I think, um, you know, I go back to the Ohio State game. He kind of flipped a switch, um, I would say, probably towards more in the second half of, okay, you know, when I get this ball, I'm either going through you 
I'm going around you, whatever it is, I'm going to score the ball. Um, and I think when he turns that on, then everybody else is freed up so much more. Um, they start playing more aggressively. They get better looks because now the team has to go and start doubling him and get the ball out of his, his hands. So I think that's the, the first part, but then obviously the guards have to find him and get him the ball. And so, um, you know, obviously shout out to, you know, Caleb Love, you know, RJ Davis, Seth, when he comes in, um, guys that are getting him, getting the, getting him the ball where he can score and be aggressive. Um, so I think it's kind of a mixture of it, but his aggressiveness and his mentality going into these last two games, I think is what he has to be every single game. Yeah. Baycott, it looks like he's doing a lot less thinking when he catches the ball on the post and he's like two steps ahead of the defender where he catches the ball with confidence pretty low. And then he knows the move he's already going to go to or, or the move that's already going to work. And you're, you're kind of seeing the, the past two games, this team looks a lot more like the team that fans were falling in love with at the end of last year than the teams we saw at the beginning of this year or, or even the beginning of last year. Um, and we've talked about the, the adjustments that Coach Davis has kind of made this year and last year within the offense with a more rigid and set system under coach Williams, were there ever any big midseason adjustments or changes in emphasis that you can remember that made a big difference or was it kind of whatever you guys started the season? That's, that's kind of how you guys were going to play the, the entire season. Um, I would say my first two years, um, there were like some very minor adjustments, but nothing that just like we didn't, you know, run a different offense or play different defensively. Um, but I think my junior year, we had a little bit more of a change, especially offensively. We would, we started, like I had mentioned before, we started doing a lot more freelance on offense um, and kind of like random actions, which that could be a random pin down or random, you know, random ball screen or random, you know, back screen for the big, whatever it might be. Um, because the problem is, especially once you start ACC play, all of those teams know exactly what plays you run. So you have to have something that can kind of keep them off guard. Um, so that was one thing that Coach Williams kind of changed for us. And then honestly, you know, for the longest, North Carolina was known for their like denying defense um, and things like that. But my junior year, we actually, Coach actually changed up a little bit based on our personnel where we were we were still getting the passing lanes but for the most part we were more in the gap which is for those who don't really know the terminology it's more helping than just trying to deny your man the ball um and i think those kind of, those changes definitely helped us going down the stretch um it's kind of crazy how he would just we would start off the season and maybe we'd lose a game or not play very well but then by midway through acc play like that's when we were playing our best basketball um, and it really wasn't a ton of changes or whatever, but he had some sort of magic or I don't know wh what you want to consider it. that just had us ready to go as, you know, really tournament play started and it was time to get it really rolling. Um, and I think hopefully that's kind of what they've got going on right now is, you know, now ACC players really starting up. So, um, coming off those two big wins and kind of seeing the success they had and how they had it, um, you know, hopefully that momentum and, and kind of their mindset can go through, you know, the rest of the year. Taking more questions from the message board, what does this team need to do and where do they need to refine a, as they start the, the conference season grind? Um, I mean, I'll say first and foremost, they need to keep the same competitive edge that they had these last two games for the rest of the time, whether they're playing, you know, the last team in ACC or they're playing against a Duke or a Virginia or whatever. Um, they need to keep that same mentality to start at each and every game. Um, and then honestly, and I don't even know if it's necessarily something that can, you know, change or whatever, but I think eventually they're going to have to be as consistent as they can from three. Um, and I think that's big for obviously the players shooting the threes, but also for the bigs down low, for Mondo, even Pete down low, because the better you can shoot it from outside, the more space there is for the bigs down low. So um, I think that's one of them, just 
continue to shoot with confidence, um, shoot the right shots, um, and hopefully kind of be as consistent as possible on that on that part. Going off that point with the shooting, what do you see as the reason for the team's three-point shooting struggles? They're shooting 30.7 this year from three compared to 35.8 last year, which was one of the top, I think, 75 shooting teams in the country. Yeah, I mean, it's – for one, you take, you know, one of the best shooters in the country off the team. Um, so that's that's first and foremost. I think sometimes it's the shot selection that you might see. Um I mean, it's you see guys in the NBA, a guy as great as Luka Doncic is shooting step back threes all game. You're not going to have the most consistent numbers just because that's such a difficult shot, not because you can't hit it. Um, So I think it's shot selection. I think it's um, the the flow of the game type shots, um, getting each other shots where they need where they want to shoot them. Um, and then too, I mean, it's just, it's tough because a team like this, they rely so heavily on two or three guys to be their shooters, as opposed to guys who can come off the bench and just really light it up. Um, so it's just a matter of those guys trying to be consistent. Um, so I think it's just, you lose a guy like Brady who, you know, was an unbelievable shooter. Um, obviously Pete has shown that he can come in and, and do a decent job of kind of filling that, you know, pick and pop forward role. But, um, you know, now it's just a matter of getting the right shots at the right times for, for the right guys. Who from the bench do you think will provide the biggest impact as, as we do head into the new year? I mean, I think the easy answer is puff just because he's been there. Um, he's played, you know, and in a bunch of games compared to a lot of these other guys on the bench. But I think some, I think a guy like Seth is going to be somebody that might not play a ton of minutes, but it's going to be key for, um, you know, the minutes that he plays. I think somebody like him that's steady can get everybody involved defensively can pressure, um, you know, full court or, or whatever, harass the other team's point guard. Um, you know, I think somebody like him is going to be big for, um, especially if, you know, if Coach Davis decides to go with more guys from off the bench to kind of keep everybody calm and, you know, collected and hopefully keep them in what they're supposed to be doing. Um, so I think those two guys are, are the two main guys. I think obviously um, Tyler Nichol has shown that he's not afraid and that he can produce um, at, at a good rate. So, um, I wouldn't be surprised if you see a little bit more of him, but I think those first two guys are the main guys for sure. Looking at the ACC as a whole, four teams are currently ranked. It's number 13, Virginia, number 14, Miami, who just beat Virginia on their home court. Um, and then you also have number 17, Duke, number 25, North Carolina. So no ACC teams in the top 25, in the top 10, in the top 25, there isn't going to be too many chances for Carolina to, to go and get these signature type wins in conference play, kind of like when you were in, in uh, the ACC, but what AC team, ACC teams have impressed you the most and, and look to be the biggest challenges stylistically for UNC this season? I mean, I think there's a few, to be honest. You see Miami beating Virginia. Miami has always been a hard place to play at. Um, I don't know why. When I was there, we went in there and got whooped. Um, I don't know if it's coaching. I don't know if it's their system. I don't know if it's the setting. I don't know what it is, but it's it's an interesting place to play at. And obviously, them coming off a big, big win like that, you know, if they keep that momentum, that's going to be a tough – I'm still going to say, obviously, you take the whole Duke rivalry out of it. Virginia at Virginia is one of the hardest places it's to win, period. Like, there's – you go down by four and you feel like you're down 20. Um, with how they play, with how the the, the fans are, um, the, the pace of the game, like, that's just a hard place to win at. Um, so, I think, I think those, you know, those two teams, and obviously you have to bring Duke into it just because it's a rivalry and – you know, they're still 17th. So, um, you know, I think those three games are going to be the biggest one. Obviously, we've already dropped one to Virginia Tech, so you can't overlook a team like that. Um, 
you can't really overlook any team. Um, so I think obviously the ACC in my mind is the best basketball um, conference in all of college basketball, even on a year that they might say that it's not as strong. I think it's still the best. So um, every game is going to be, be a tough one more than likely. So hopefully they can, you know, have the right mindset going in. Yeah. They, North Carolina, only plays Miami once this year. They catch them in Chapel Hill, so you don't have to worry about the trip to Coral Gables. But everybody loves a, a trip to Coral Gables. I think <laughs> you could always use it to break it up in in, in the winter. Um, but they play Virginia at Charlottesville on January 10th, um, and then back in Chapel Hill at the end of February. The Miami game is February 13th, and then of course you have the the two games against Duke, and then. Like you mentioned, there there's a lot of teams you can't you can't get caught slipping in the ACC. Uh, Wake Forest has gotten North Carolina recently. Notre Dame has gotten North Carolina recently. Um, so the ACC, I, I agree with you. Where the ACC, you have to bring your best game every night. And uh, if I had to pick which team stylistically for that gives UNC the most challenges, uh, I would probably agree with you, Virginia. Virginia, the the way Virginia plays, I was at that game at Virginia the year you guys won the national championship. It was like a five point game, and I was ready to leave. I was like, I was like, I was like yeah, we're not coming back from this. Oh my goodness, it's it's weird. Like, and shout out to their fans, but like their fans, they go so crazy over the smallest things. Like, it'll be a simple defensive stop, and their fans will go ballistic and so like good you rotation being opposing, defense yeah it's like you being an opposing <laughs> team you're like you don't really know what to feel like it's like okay they just stopped us but it feels like like they just freaking won the game off that stop so um you know we'll we'll see but hopefully we can go in there and sneak one out somebody from the message board said that they would like to hear you talk about the talent skill difference and adjustments you had to make from college to the nba and then maybe compare that jump from high school to college, college to NBA. Um, that's actually a really good one. Um, I think when you think of high school to college, a lot of the guys that, especially like going to North Carolina, a lot of the guys are the number one option, probably, you know, if not the best in their state, the, definitely the best in their, you know, their area. Um, some are highly ranked in the nation. Um, so literally everything is pretty easy to you in high school. You get the ball all the time in high school. You have all the accolades. Everybody's talking about you. Then you go to college, and it's the first time that you are in a setting where it's not just your age group. I think that's that's the, that's the kind of the first adjustment. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm 17, 18 years old. And I'm sitting next to a guy in the locker room that's 21, 22, um, which means they have maturity. They have experience at the college level. They have probably they're probably faster and stronger than you are. Um, and you're not necessarily the top dog. Uh, so it's it's an adjustment. Obviously, physically, but a lot more mentally from the standpoint of, OK, what is my role on this team? And I think it's basically the same jump to the NBA when it comes to that. It's just now we're talking about the top 400 players in the world trying to fight for, you know, a roster spot and playing time and all that kind of thing. And then you bring money into the, into the equation. Um, so it's basically, it, it's basically the same kind of jump. It's just now we're talking about grown men trying to provide for their family jobs Um and at the end of the day, there's really no bad basketball player in the NBA. So you really have to try to find your niche and what it is that will keep you in the NBA. Um, I think so many people, so many times people are so caught up in just trying to make it to the NBA when really the real thing that you should be trying to do is try to stay there as long as you possibly can. Um, so I think those are kind of the, the differences. Obviously, I could go on and on about the little small details that are different, but I think those are the biggest adjustments because even, you know, now going from college, trying to make it to the NBA, Mondo is a freaking beast in college basketball. And then you go to the NBA and you've got a guy like 
Joel Embiid and Jokic that you now are like, okay, how am I going to stop this guy or even score against him? So um, it's just kind of that kind of adjustment, but uh, you kind of figure it out as you go and figure out your way of, of having success. So it's, it's interesting. I'll tell you that. I feel like you only mentioned Embiid because you know, he, he broke my heart yesterday. Knicks were looking good and the fourth quarter happened <laughs> and Embiid and Harden hey. just punished up. Hey, look, I, um, you know, you made the comment earlier talking about how New York saved North Carolina Unfortunately, I don't know if New York will be able to save themselves. Um, it's a it's a balance, and then, so you know you got to take the good with the bad, man. Yeah. You know, so right now we're, we'll take the good for North Carolina. Yeah, my uh, my Merry Nixmas. They they canceled my Christmas. <laughs> it was over after that point. Um, but I I like these questions because it gives the chance for fans to be in your shoes, and there's a lot more questions along these lines. Um, you mentioned bringing money into the equation. What are NBA players saying about NIL and and the future of college basketball? Um, I'd probably say it's a mix. Uh, I'll tell you from my experience, from my standpoint, um, I love the fact that the players are getting paid for the college game that they bring to entertain people. And obviously they bring – billions of dollars to the NCAA. Um, so I love the fact that they're getting some sort of compensation for the work that they put in and for all of that. Um, I think the only problem that you could fall into down the road is um, the hunger for the game. Um, I mean, I, I can't imagine being in college and I'm making 100 to 200 K you know, in one year in college. Like I remember in college trying to go, you know, to the office to get my stipend check on the day that we were supposed to, like, just so I could put that into the account. Right. You so were the was, first person at the office. Yeah. I was before, there before, like, the, before the office opened. He was, yeah. They weren't even there yet. Like they were like, dang, Justin, like, we don't open till, you know, nine 30 and it's nine o'clock. Um, so it's like, that's, and so for, 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 for us up until the NIL deals, the only way to get paid was to, okay, we got to make it to be a pro. Um, and now, I mean, you, you know, you got guys, like I said, making money that G league guys don't even make. Right. So it's like, I think that's the only issue that you could run into, but I will stand on saying, I'm very happy that players are getting compensation for the amount of money that they bring in based off of their skills and their likeness, all that kind of stuff. Um, so hopefully it doesn't tarnish kind of the love of the game and the the work ethic of players because they know, okay, I'm getting paid in college anyway. So why do I really need to grind to make it to the NBA? So I hope that doesn't change, but I love the players getting paid me personally. What were practice preparations like during the holidays when you were at UNC and how did, how did you balance, you know, spending quality time, around Christmas and then also knowing that you, you do have a game coming up? Um, yeah, so I, I, I think most players get probably like a week or so to go home, um, maybe a little less. Um, so I would obviously go home and spend time with my family. But then the problem with Christmas break is there's no limit to par- practice hours. Like you don't have practice. I mean, you don't have classes. You don't have tutoring that you have to get to. There's nothing else that you have to worry about when you're on campus. So, uh, if if Coach Davis really wanted to, he could call a four hour practice, and there's no issues. Like, so thankfully, Coach Williams didn't go overboard. But most of the time, especially leading up to like ACC play really starting up, we would have longer practices. Um, maybe a little bit more film than usual uh, because we just didn't have anything else to do. So, um, and coach was a basketball fanatic. So if there was anything he felt like we needed to work on, then we were going to work on that. Um, But I think that's the biggest thing is there's no limit to the hours that you can practice or whatever. So 
I'm sure some coaches take full advantage of that, but Coach Williams was never – he was never overboard with it. So uh, the great thing is you don't have classes. So after practice, you get to just go chill, eat, hang out with the homies. Um, so, you know, th this was honestly probably the best time of college, um, even though you couldn't necessarily go home for a while. You bringing up Coach Williams just made me think of a question I wanted to ask you. You have Coach Williams, Coach Davis. Who do you think is is more passionate about basketball and, and more competitive when it comes to basketball? Because I, I could I think you can make an argument for, for both when when you have two guys who can get moved to tears by basketball. Yeah, I mean <laughs> that's a tough that is a tough question because Coach Williams, and I think he low-key is finally just now getting out of this, but he literally, his life was North Carolina basketball. Like, if we had a bad game, like, he would always he, he would always let you know, too, which was hilarious. But, like, he wouldn't sleep that night. Like, he, he couldn't – he already barely slept, you know, even if we played well, like, watching film and stuff like that. But, like, he couldn't sleep if we had a bad game. Like, meanwhile, the players are like, that was a bad one, y'all. Like, let's get another one and go right to sleep. Don't lose any sleep over. But he was like, if anything was off, like, he was off. Um, so he was like that. But then you have, a, like, Coach Davis played at North Carolina. He played in the NBA, like, one of the most competitive leagues in the world. Um, and then now he's coached at North Carolina. So it's like, I think the biggest thing is each one of theirs love for North Carolina. I think that's really where it might be different than other places is how coach Williams loved North Carolina. And obviously coach Davis does too. Like they've both have always talked about how much it means to them and their careers and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's really what gives them the edge is the love for who they're coaching. Um, but I'm going to say they're both. I don't want to, I don't want to get in trouble with, with, the goat himself, or I don't want to get a call from Coach Davis. So, um, you know, we'll 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 say both of them are some of the most competitive people I've ever been around. Yeah, from talking to Coach Davis, I think when we talked to him last year, and he was like, "Yeah, sometimes, sometimes basketball just moves me to tears. I just want to win so bad it moves me to tears." And then uh, a behind the scenes story: um, when I was at Madison Square Garden, I saw Coach Williams in the elevator, and I started talking with him. And he was talking about a former player who um, tore their shoulder and, and how much it was torn. And he was he was telling me that he was mad that his shoulder was more torn than Coach Davis's was at the time, <laughs> or that Coach Williams was at the time. And in my mind, when I'm in the elevator, I'm like laughing. I'm like, that doesn't sound healthy to be that upset and that competitive about. Oh, he, he was. But but the thing about Coach Williams, he was competitive about literally everything. Like it was like he had, I want to say it was a it was a hip. Was it his hip? Or his knee? No, it was his knee. It was his knee. He had like knee surgery and like he made it a competition of how fast he could get back out on the golf course. And it's like, no, like just take care of your knee, <laughs> get it back right, and then you can get back on the golf course. But he's like he's just wired for everything to be a competition. And it's like, even if it's just within himself. So <laughs> he's, he's a wild it's, man. It's why he puts the banners up though. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, getting back to basketball, but also getting your perspective on this. Somebody said, given the fact that Mondo will likely be double teamed in the post, can you briefly walk through what coaches are teaching him and to other players as well? knowing that double teams can come from different defensive positions and places on the floor just to get a better sense of the X's and O's to how to best navigate when you know a double team is coming? Yeah, I mean, it just, you know, it just depends on how the teams are co are coming with the double. Um, a team like Virginia, Virginia always came from, like, the baseline side. So – their big would just force him baseline. And then the other big would be right there to basically kind of trap him. Um, other teams, they basically come from like whoever throws the ball in, they'll go off of that guy that passed it and go double. Um, 
And so it just depends on which side they're coming from. I know for us, we would like, if we were playing in Virginia, the whole, like whatever, maybe one or two practices that we were going over Virginia, we would basically have drills to where, okay, throw the ball into the post, you know, scout team or whatever would come and try to trap or double. And then you have to make a read out of that. So it's really just about kind of seeing it, having reps against it. Um, and kind of the same thing for, you know, if another team was, you know, for instance, like Bryce, team started doubling him. So we would just do different drills to kind of get, let the big see it and then also let the guards and whoever else were moving around him to also see where their outlet spots were to come to the ball or whatever. So um, it's tough because a lot of times it's just on the guy who's getting doubled to be able to make a read out of that. Um, so, you know, hopefully Mondo is able to, you know, once he starts getting doubled more and more, hopefully he's able to make those, those passes out or whatever play needs to be made um, to get somebody a shot. The last question I have is from a user on the premium message board, UNC secondary break. And I'm only giving him credit for the name because he has a stat in here. So in case it's wrong, I don't want anybody to come at me. It was UNC secondary break. Uh, and I don't know where he, where he would have got this from, but he said Justin only had his shot blocked five times in his college career. How were you able to use your size and length to your advantage to get shots off in the paint and around the rim? Like, like what kind of techniques were you using out there? Um, I would also say five. Does, does five sound right? It's, I would have to go back and look. For me, like what's really sticking in my mind is my freshman year when Justin Anderson completely obliterated my shot off the backboard. And that one feels like it was like 10 blocks, like right there. Yeah. So, but I also, I think the biggest thing for me was like my floater was one of my go-to shots. And so a lot of times the floater, you're able to catch bigs off guard to where they can't block your shot. Um, on the perimeter, most of the time I was taller than the guys that were guarding me um, or there was just separation because I had bigs that were setting really good screens for me. Um, so on the perimeter, I just didn't really, you know, wasn't really blocked very often, but inside I really didn't, which was honestly kind of a knock on me, but I really didn't finish at the rim a whole lot. Like a lot of it was floaters and like, runners and things like that to get the bigs off guard um so i think that's kind of why i wasn't blocked a ton was because i wasn't somebody that was like trying to challenge the the footer at the rim and try to finish on him. um so yeah i think the floater is kind of the the main culprit of that is is the floater something you like would work on because i feel like most coaches would tell people that's like one of the worst shots you can take so <laughs> So how did you get so good at it? So what's crazy is, man, so I, I was shooting in like middle school, high school, and it was because I was always way skinnier and like way more, I'll say fragile than most guys. So like I found a way to be able to score inside without getting beat up all the time. Um, but I never really practiced it, to be honest. Like I never, I just started shooting it. And then even when I went to college, like I would, you know, I would get my like five floaters from five spots or whatever, but like I would never, I wouldn't spend hours in the gym working on it. It was just like a feel, like a touch thing. Um, and so when I got to school, obviously that was like my bread and butter in high school. When I got to college, Coach Williams didn't really like floaters either. Like he wasn't, he wasn't a fan of them at all. But when I got there, um, I like, I like couldn't shoot from the outside when I first got to school. Like my threes, they, it was like, I averaged, I made the joke. I averaged like one air ball a game in the beat down my freshman year. Um, but like anytime I got to the paint, like if I got a floater off, most of the time it was going in. Um, and so coach Williams, like he even joked about it. He was like, there's only like two players that I would, that I am totally okay with shooting a floater. And it, it was me and Marcus. Like we were the only two that he was like, didn't freak out about if we shot a floater. So um, I guess I just, I, I got lucky with having his blessing on shooting that shot. Cause yeah, even now in the NBA, like it was kind of the same thing. Like 
analytics and all that. It's like mid range floaters, all that kind of stuff. It's a terrible shot, but all the coaches and stuff, they're like, dude, we're totally okay with you shooting it. So just shoot it if you if you've got it. Yeah, I was thinking that earlier this year when uh, the message board was having like a meltdown on the, I think it was the Alabama game, the Caleb Love floaters. And I think somebody posted, I don't remember who it was, but somebody was like, if it's not this guy shooting a floater, then I don't want to see it. And it was just a picture of you. <laughs> it's either, it's something you have or you don't. And, and you were, you were blessed to have it, but that is all we have this week. I, I love when we take the questions from the premium message board. Always a good time. Always great insight. Carolina back in action on Friday at Pittsburgh. And then they're back home Wednesday, January 4th against Wake Forest. We will be back after those two games to break it all down. Justin, appreciate it. And have a happy new year, my guy. Same to you, man. I appreciate you.